talking about math. But before I get to that, I want to ask all of you a few questions. So assuming everyone here has taken math at a certain point of time, or is currently studying math, how many of you enjoy taking math? Now, keep your hands up. Now, all of you with your hands up, how many of you enjoy learning about probability? Well, I see a lot of hands dropping in the audience, but I'm here to try and change that. Which brings me to the title of my talk today, How Much Do We Know About Probability? Now, I'm guessing most of you know the game of coin toss. It's probably the most common scenario spoken about when it comes to probability calculations. Every coin has a head and a tail, and the probability of, each, of getting each side a head or a tail is equal to 0.5, correct? Well, I'm saying that this could potentially be wrong. When we toss a coin, we are taught and assume that there are only two possibilities that could happen. Either the head faces up or the tail does, which does seem quite rational at first glance. But when we think about it, what if the coin were to fall on its edge? Or if the coin were to break into two midair? If we think about it, it's, it's entirely plausible for the coin to be swept away by a bird before the toss is even complete. Now I know many of you in the audience may be arguing that every event I just spoke about is an impossible event. But this brings me to the possibility of a set of infinite possibilities for a given event. Now what this means for this situation is that the probability of getting a heads is equal to the probability of getting a tails, which is not equal to 0 0.5. Now, before I get on to a few more examples, I'm going to be talking about a few common terms that I'll be using a lot from here on. Now, a set. A set is a collection of data, or in our case, it'll be a collection of possibilities, or an outcome for which we're going to be calculating the probability of. Now, a sample size is the number of individual data pieces or possibilities in that given set. In other terms, it can be said to be the size of the set. Now, P of A, as many of you may know, is the probability of set event A happening, and it's calculated using the following formula. Now, the next, the next term, which is known as P of A given B, expresses a, a concept called conditional probability, and it is calculated using the following formula. However, we won't be using this formula from here on, but more rather we'll be using the, con the condition, conditional probability and the term itself. Now, what this expresses is an interdependence or interrelation between the two events A and B, and it'll be used from example two to come as I said before. Now let's talk about the weather. Now, I'm sure most of you here know that we know what we know about how the weather is gonna be over the next few days because of forecasts. And I'm sure most of you also know that forecasts tell us the most likely weather pattern to occur. That is the weather pattern with the highest probability of occurring. So we probably consider what the weather forecast tell us to be pretty accurate. But on many occasions, it can deceive us. Now, this is probably why meteorology is often the part of jokes made on professions. But exactly how unreliable are these weather forecasts? So all the observations made about a specific area's temperature, humidity, and air conditions, such as on other such atmospheric conditions are taken into account from present and past records of a specific area's weather stations. Now this builds a nearly infinite set of possibilities of that given area to calculate the weather forecasts. So when we think about it, it's pretty similar to an infinite set. However, there are large uncertainties in the extrapolation of such data, which were created due to chaos. This unfortunately also means that in areas where there are small unknowns in the weather that ultimately result in large fluctuations, the forecast can be quite unreliable. Therefore, extremely dangerous weather situations cannot easily be predicted as well, because the number of times normal weather has occurred far outweighs the number of times a strange occurrence of weather has occurred in the same area. Let's take, for example, the data collected from the meteorological center of fictional town A. Now, over here, we can see that under a given set of common conditions, the number of times normal weather, such as sunny, cloudy, or rainy days, is a high number when compared to the number of times extreme weather has occurred. In fact, we can say that the number of times extreme weather has occurred is quite insignificant. Now, but when we think about it, short in, un, under a short period of time, accurate weather predictions can be made. Because when we think about it, we're taking into account every strange occurrence of weather and every outlier that is taking place in a given area. However, new scientific methods of meteorology rely on running multiple simulations to increase their, their sample space, which in their view increases their accuracy. By, but this unfortunately also means that a biased forecast could occur, in my opinion, as through programming, the, 
simulations increase the probability in favor of the normal weather occurrences since they've happened more times in the past. Now, this approach also ignores the possibility of a new weather occurrence. Relying on past evidence thus makes it unreliable in the sense that for calculations of probability, we do not take into account possibilities that are not a part of the given set. Now, this unfortunately means that the feasibility of use and existence of an infinite set in terms of a weather forecast, if we're taking that as the main basis of the examples, is once again divided and its feasibility of use is also questioned. So, what if this could be solved by if we define the term infinite set or consideration of infinite possibilities? Now when we think about it, an infinite set can be drawn parallel to a universal set. Now a universal set is a defined mathematical concept that consists of every single possibility or data piece in a given concept or theory. It is represented by the italic letter U. Now if we wish to, if we wish to visualize this universal set in terms of a set diagram, here's how we can do it. Now when we talk about an infinite sample space or an infinite set, this boundary of the universal set pushes it, and if I may even may say, surpasses the boundaries of a finite and quantifiable sample space. So now the set diagram looks a little more like this for an infinite set, because the boundary is not defined. But the problem with this is that many contradictions arise when it comes to the feasibility of use and existence of an infinite set in terms that it cannot be used for defined and close sets of possibilities, or an event which is very defined. Now let us take, for example, the probability of me coming to school on a given day. In this case, there are only two possibilities or two events that could happen. Either A, I come to school, or B, I don't come to school. The duration for which I attend class, whether I'm marked present, and whether I fall sick in between, has no effect on the occurrence on whether it is a part of, uh, counted as a part of A or B. By physically entering the premise for even a second, the trial is counted as a part of set A. Now, even then, there are some examples that support the existence of an infinite set. Let us take, for example, search engines. There are databases with an infinite access or an unlimited access to information, if I may say, and they use keywords to, um, in a way, distribute this information and filter this information using the occurrence of the keywords and relevance by basis of the keywords to allow us to find the information we want very easily. So it can easily be asserted this is that this is the closest thing we know to an infinite set. However, due to varying uh, searches and user base updates, we can say that the probability of finding a given web page at a given set of at a, with the given keywords at any point in time is always changing. That is, in a U of internet links, the probability of finding ABC web page given XYZ keywords is continuously varying. Now, let us say, for example, if I'm trying to look at the answer to a certain question, I'm probably not going to find the answer that I want. Let us take, for example, what I tried to look up the other day. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find what I wanted, which is what I'm trying to explain to you guys today. Now, even then, we can say we still don't know if an infinite set exists, because we're seeing that it applies to some situations, but in other situations, it does not. Now, what if, now let us take what Bertrand Russell had said one day. Now, if we think about an infinite set or an infinite sample space, we're considering one large set in which each individual possibility is its own separate set with no intersections in between. This is how it can be visualized in terms of the set diagram. Now, according to Bertrand Russell, however, there is no set of all sets that does not contain itself. Now, this very confusing statement is what is referred to as Russell's paradox. And it, it discovered many contradictions or many limits to limitless set theories that were built on non-mathematical language. Now, much like what we're doing now. Now, this is represented using the following mathematical statement. Now, I know this looks very confusing, which is why I'm going to show you all an example that will probably simplify this, this paradox. Now, consider there is one barber in a town. In a very small town, there is one barber. But however, he has one condition to the customer as he takes. He only shaves men who do not shave themselves. But consider that this barber did not shave himself. Then who shaves the barber? This kind of contradiction is what the Russell's paradox wishes to point out and can unfortunately be applied to our set theory itself. So needless to say, the universal set, um, apologies, the infinite set theory has been falsified. Now the discovery of this paradox 
allowed me to look at a lot of other paradoxes that have always been an interest of mine. So I'm going to show you all another, another paradox that will probably be a lot more easier to understand and hopefully a lot more engaging. Now consider I were to offer you two envelopes. One of them has twice as much as money as the other. And these two envelopes are identical in terms of both shape and size. So you cannot distinguish which envelope has more money just by sight. I ask you to choose an envelope, and once you choose the envelope, you get to take the money inside of it. But before you get to inspect the envelope, I ask you if you want to switch. Now, would you switch or would you not? Now, hands up, how many of you would switch the envelopes? And how many of you wouldn't? I'm guessing the rest wouldn't. Interesting, so here's what I've found. When we think about it at first glance, switching the envelope seems quite pointless. However, when we look at the situation again, we could possibly gain twice as much as money while risking to only lose half of what we have. Now let's try the mathematical approach to this situation. If we think about it, A, let us take that A is the amount of money that we have in the first selected envelope. This means that there are two possibilities which have an equal probability of occurring. Either there is an A by 2 amount of money in the other envelope, meaning that we have the larger sum of money or there is a two-way amount of money in the other envelope, meaning that we have the lesser amount of money. So if we try to calculate the amount of money in the other envelope, the expected amount of money, this is the equation that we can derive, which gives us that the sum of that the amount of envelope, the money in the other envelope is 5 by 4 a. Now this value is quite obviously greater than the value of a. So we are asked to switch the envelope. Now the problem with this is that we can re re-derive this entire equation once we switch the envelope. So finally, there have been proposed situations that have taken the sum of this money as a constant and have in fact proved that switching is no better than keeping the envelope. It's all a game of chance, much like heads or tails, which finally enough circles us right back to the top. So why did I talk about all of this? How does any of this interest or benefit any of you in any way at all? I took the infinite set theory that I constructed and later disproved that didn't have much validity behind it, but it challenged me to think about the what ifs. When I first learned probability in high school, I can honestly tell you that it didn't interest me at all. But then I looked into it deeper, and then I discovered something. What I wanted to teach all of you is what I eventually learned. But we can't just take the things that we learned at school with face value. We need to look at them from a new or undiscovered perspective. Now, this, this philosophy doesn't just apply to math. It can apply to every subject that we learn, or anything we do in our lives. If we can will ourselves to not dismiss everything we view as uninteresting at first glance, then we have the chance to shape what we learn and teach others. Thank you.